Leanne, because uh, she, she does all the work, she, is, uh, she trains all the animals and she gets up at very early in the morning, the, the 2 a.m. shifts to, to measure veterinary emissions and um, uh, just to comment on the previous one, but, uh, we actually follow what, what Alex put the, to, together this every three hours kind of thing, so once every three hours, kind of over 72 hours, so that allows you to actually get uh, good uh, estimation and we, we don't have too much of the background. Uh, uh, interference as well. So that seems to work quite well for us and in some cases we keep the, the green field a little bit away from the animals as well. It, uh, you can't do it in every situation, particularly in the dairy setting, you can't really do that, but in, in a beef setting, that's what we do. We, we keep the, the green field away from the animals and then we take the animals uh, one by one to that, to that thing. So um, I'm not sure how to control this. This one here? Alright, so uh, as I said, I'm just going to give a, a little bit of introduction. So most of the stuff that we do, um, uh, at least what my team does at UC Davis, is um, feed additives. So we, we use the green field mostly for the feed additive uh, kind of work. So we've done quite a, a bit of those uh, feed additives. Um, in, in dairy, uh, we, we, we did uh, with seaweed, and we, uh, we just finished one on, on the direct fed microbials and uh, uh, another one on, on ruin proof as well. And you can see the orange here, that's unit 16. That's uh, one of the very earliest uh, uh, green feed and uh, as Scott said, we actually used it for quite a while and we just, we just uh, replaced it. I think uh, maybe last year or something like that we replaced it, but we've had it for many, many years and it's been uh, working quite well for us. So this is at the, at the dairy. And uh, for uh, beef, so this is what I mean, uh, we, we keep the, the green feed quite away from the, the rest of the animals there. Uh, so we, we've done work on uh, lemongrass, uh, which will be presented um, at, at this conference, so that the results of that will be available. Uh, another, another work on rumen beef. We've done work with uh, Mutrol, also on the, on the same field of that, and Biochar that uh, Diana did as well, and uh, she will talk more about uh, that work as well. So we have several presentations uh, at this conference. Um, and then we do have a couple of green feet um, outside the country as well. So this is the one in, in Ethiopia. And uh, Liana was there to help set, set it up. And we've, we've had some issues there because of uh, mostly the internet connections is not very good. Uh, and so uh, to get data and to transmit data, we've had quite a bit of issue there. And also, uh, getting the parts there is really, really difficult. Uh, a lot of the parts have been held in immigration, and yeah, so we've had quite a, a bit of uh, challenges. Um, what what was, uh, we have another unit in uh, Burkina Faso, where it is a small dominant unit, um, and that, that has been working quite well. Again, the, there is uh, just two presentations, one is at 1 o'clock uh, on, on, on methane, and the other one, um, a more general one, uh, later on in, 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 in the week as well. And uh, the main reason we actually had this is not for, for methane. This is actually for um, energy requirement. I know Pekka is going to talk about it, so I'm not going to steal his, his thunder. Uh, but uh, we got those uh, two machines in Ethiopia and, and Burkina Faso. We added the oxygen uh, analyzer there so that you know, we measure oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane, so that we can use Brouwer's equation to, to calculate uh, uh, heat production, and that way we try to calculate the requirement of, of this animal. So the main, the main uh, thing that we, we use in there is because we're using indigenous animals in, 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 in those places, and so um, the, the, the energy requirement is not really being established. So this is how we're trying to, instead of having a, a full calorimetric chamber that we've done before, or, or slaughter technique or anything like that, we try to use the, the green feed to be able to, uh, to, to, to give us the, the calculations. One of the challenges we had in, in Ethiopia was uh, some of the indigenous animals, um, they had huge horns. And so to try to fit this in, in green feed was a bit of a challenge. So we were selecting animals that don't have that, that does, uh, those big horns. Uh, I think in the end it was, it, it was fine, but you know, there are some things that you don't think about. Um, and then, yeah, th th those challenges are on the ground. Okay, so I think I'm going to 
pass it on to Leanna for, for the rest. Thanks, Dr. Kabrab. Hi, my name is Leanna Kelly. I'm a student at UC Davis in Dr. Kabrab's lab, and I've worked with the Green Team both on campus at UC Davis, and I've worked with the unit in Ethiopia. Um, as Dr. Kabrab said, that unit did present some interesting challenges. Um, you know, I was emailing with CLOC, okay, well, the power's gonna go off here today at five, so with the time difference, can you call me at 6 a.m. so we can figure out how to install the solar panels? And they were very helpful, so I'm very appreciative to them for that. Um, yeah, there was a lot more practical problems there also, like the horns, uh, kind of one of those funny research conundrums that you run into. Uh, but yeah, we did end up just selecting the animals with the smaller horns there. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about data collection and also training the animals to use the green feed. I'm going to talk about data collection first because in order to understand why we train the animals the way that we do, um, it's necessary to first understand our objectives with the data collection. Um, so this is the timeline that we used for the most recent green feed project I was working on um, using biochar to see the effect on enteric methane emissions. And um, I'll present, be presenting my work on that at the poster session tomorrow night. Um, so for this project, we started with a covariate period just so we could get a baseline measurement um, of methane emissions with no feed additive for the steers, um, just to see if we had any you know, high, extra high methane producers or low methane producers. So we did that for 14 days, and then we did um, a green feed sampling weekend, which I'll explain what that is um, shortly. Then we added the biochar to the ration, um, and we were feeding the steers on three different diets. So a high forage diet to start, that was for 31 days, transition diet for 11, and then the finisher diet for 42 days. And we did our um, green feed measurements approximately every 14 days. We did have some really high heat days in Davis. It was over 115 degrees, so we decided not to sit all those days. Um, so this timeline is similar to one that my colleague Brianna Roque used for her Asparagopsis taxiformis um, study. In that study, they did sampling every three weeks, just because it was uh, the study was um, longer in duration. Um, but that is the the um, model that we were using to uh, sample for our experiment. So, um, like I mentioned, those green feed sampling weekends. So during that time, what we're doing is we're taking eight um, three-hour samples to cover the full 24 hours of the day. So um, what we did was uh, split the day up into the 24 hours, and then we blocked that into eight three-hour segments. Um, so during each of these three-hour segments, we're getting all of the research animals, all 24 animals, to use the green feed one time. So it's about 192 samples altogether, 24 spheres times uh, eight samples each. Uh, we broke it up in these three, or these eight groups, um, just based on the schedule that worked for us, because we were feeding at 8 a.m., um, so we wanted to get a sample right before feeding, so that's the 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. sample, kind of that empty rumen sample, and then um, samples after feeding as well, so that's why we broke it up into um, these groups, but you can really break it up into whatever um, time periods where, I know for the dairy, they have to, our, our dairy trials, we have to break it up differently because of um, meal payment and things like that. So in order to preserve um, our sanity as well as to get good background data, we split these this 24-hour um, sampling up over three days, so that's we call it a green feed sampling weekend. It's a lot of fun. Um, so on the first day, we're sampling from eight to eleven and two to five, and then on the second day, that's the very fun two a.m. to five a.m. Uh, green feed sampling time. Um, so then, over those three days, we're covering the full 24 hours, and we have eight three-hour periods, the, the 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. and the 11 to 2. It's very helpful uh, to have 
really hardworking interns with you uh, during those times. <laughs> Um, so, with this sampling schedule for training, we need to make sure that we can train each of the steers basically on command to use the green feed. Because um, if we're trying to have them in the green feed for approximately five minutes, and we have 24 steers, just having them each in for five minutes, that's already two hours. And we only have three hours to do the sampling, and obviously we need time to move each animal out and move each animal in and for them to be, you know, difficult and not want to go in. So we really need to have them trained so that when we want them to use the green feed, they're going to walk over there and use it. Um, so to, to train them to do this, these are whole scenes, but we, uh, this is a beef trial. Um, initially, so this is how our pens were set up. We had three pens and each of them had a front section and a back section. So for the first few days of getting the animals used to the green feed, we just put the green feed in the pen with them, um, threw some of their TMR into the sampling tray here, um, just to get them kind of curious about it and to get them walking over to it and starting to use it. And then we moved it um, into all three pens. Um, we had it in there for probably about two days each. Initially, we did have to have someone in someone there during the whole time just to monitor and make sure the animals weren't, you know, using it as a scratching post or chewing up wires or knocking things over. And actually what we found really helpful because we were moving it um, around so often is that we had a little battery backup system that could power the green feed for between like five and ten minutes. Um, just because when we were moving it from pen to pen we didn't want the whole machine to turn off. Um, because when we turn it back on, it needs a little bit of time to start up and get that backgrounding information. Um, so we had a battery backup system just so we could move it around and also to avoid, you know, clumsiness, tripping over the wire, unplugging it, and then you only have three hours to get them all sampled and you have to wait a few minutes for it to start up again. So that was definitely helpful um, for moving the green feed around. So, after we had had all the animals kind of get used to it, we could look through the data and see, okay, who's using it regularly? Obviously, you're going to have some steers that are really top-notch. They use it every opportunity they get. Those are the good ones. Smokey, number 42, he loves using the green feed. And then you're going to have some more stubborn animals. So we're, what we did was we split or we said, okay, we have one hour to get everyone in this pen sampled, and this was still in our practicing phase. So after they used it, we would move them into the front part of the pen. So in each pen, we would have probably uh, three to five that were very confident in using it. We'd you know, kind of move them over to the machine, or they'd walk over on their own, use it, and we move them into the front. Then we have about three or four in each pen that were very stubborn and did not want to walk over to the green feed. We would leave it in there and see, okay, maybe if we leave, they'll walk over and use it. Uh, maybe if we move them over to it, they'll use it. They did not want to use it. And this made us very frustrated. So then, um, at the suggestion of my interns and some of my colleagues, we thought, okay, what if we make the green feed, we'll add some gates and we'll kind of put it in its own little pen. And we'll move one of the steers into it. So setting it up like that actually started to really work well. Once the steer was kind of separated and off on its own to use the green feed, we had a lot more success. And we got pretty much all of those um, stubborn steers to use the green feed, which really is very happy. Um, obviously, you're always going to have some steers that are reluctant to use it. Number 35, Steve, over the course of three months used the green feed once. He just didn't want to use it. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, so now that we had added all of these additional gates to the green feed to put it in that um, small kind of pen off on its side, we decided it was going to be really hard to move it from pen to pen to do all the sampling. Um, especially, like I said, we were on a three hour timeline um, and we're doing this at two o'clock in the morning. We didn't want to be moving it around. So what we ended up doing was keeping it stationary in the middle pen. 
I think if we had a chance to redo it, what we would have done is put it in a separate pen, not where the animals were, so that we could just walk them over to it. But at this point, we had been training them for a while to use it in the pen, and we needed to get the experiment started, and we didn't want to um, be having to train them to walk to another pen and use it there. So we just installed it um, into the middle pen, and when we weren't sampling, we um, just fenced it off so that the animals couldn't access it during those times. And then what we would do was just um, move each different pen through the middle pen to use it, always starting with a different group. Um, and that was really successful towards, um, once we got the experiment going, I would say we were having about 90% of the cattle using it out of eight out of eight of the sampling periods, and then um, I would say almost all of them, except for Steve, would use it um, at least five out of the eight sampling periods. But like I said, since we're doing it only over three hours, we can't really wait around for one of the steers to use it because we basically have one hour for each group to use it. So at a certain point, we have to decide, okay. That steer's not going to use it during this sampling period, we just have to move on. And I think um, something that helped with training the animals to use the green feed is we were using the roughage intake control, the RIC system, for their feeding. So they were already used to like sticking their head into something to get feed. Um, so sticking their head into the green feed wasn't quite as far into them. So I think that was definitely helpful in training them um, how to use the green feed. And uh, that's everything I have for now, so is there any questions?